it's 100 years from now. As we all expected, the web has won the app wars with native applications. So this is us celebrating. We beat iOS and Android. We've won. <laughs> but on the other hand, we're sort of in the midst of a whole new browser wars. Um, I spent a lot of time coming up with different names for what I think like futuristic browsers could be. So I just need to call your attention to my favorite, Opera Maxi, which is like the opposite of Opera Mini. So instead of being built for budget devices, can only run on like 50 core machines or something like that. And of course, as we all expect, Brexit is still coming. <laughs> Don't ask me why Boris Johnson is still going to be the prime minister in 100 years. <laughs> Maybe he's a vampire. OK. <laughs> so um, how are we writing CSS in 100 years? So as you would expect, there's a lot of new features being introduced. So things that were just new in 2019, like Houdini, obviously, they've like become completely commonplace. And um, this joke has already kind of been spoiled because I thought I was going to say, oh, there's JS and CSS, but someone else has already kind of said, yeah, it already exists. But I think this is just proof that I'm actually from the future because this is actually what it's going to be like, so JS and CSS. But even with the introduction of all of these new features, we still have the concept of not trying to break the web. We still need to... Um, embrace concepts like progressive enhancement. And there are lots of different ways we can do this. Um, the most, one of the most basic is making use of the cascading feature of CSS. So it allows us to do things like build rules on top of each other and start from a base experience that should work everywhere and then build more and more progressively enhanced features on top of this. So for the old browsers that don't support this awesome JS and CSS syntax, they'll just fall back to the regular, um, regular CSS. And the cascade is great for providing fallbacks for declaration by declaration case. But what if you have groups of styles that are dependent on each other? For example, display Beyonce. <laughs> which um, it looks very similar to display grids, but um, just ignore that. It's a totally different thing. <laughs> um, and that's where things like feature queries come in. So they allow us to group styles within this feature query and only apply them if the browser supports that particular feature. And even in 2019, feature queries are really, really well supported. It's like almost an entire sea of green. I mean, except for one particular browser that we will not name. I mean, you know things are bad when like Opera Mini supports a feature, but Internet Explorer does not support that feature. That's like pretty bad. <laughs> but the good thing is that we, it doesn't actually matter that feature queries aren't 100% supported, because if we use them in a certain way, we can still get the benefit of them. And the best way to use feature queries is to kind of focus on using positive feature queries. And this is where we're checking to see if the um, particular feature is supported. And this is as opposed to negative feature queries, where we're checking to see if a feature is not supported. And the main reason for focusing on positive rather than negative is because um, it's going to be way more likely that the feature, if the browser doesn't support feature queries, it's probably more likely that it will not support whatever feature that you're trying to query on. So it's way more likely that you're going to have that um, scenario. So you'll probably, see, you'll probably still have the outcome that you wanted. So another thing about um, the future is that everyone, and like literally everyone, is online. And in 2019, about 54% of web pages are written in English. And as you all know, like living in a French-speaking country, this isn't actually representative of the world at large because actually only about 20% of the global population speaks English. What's more, there's also an imbalance in the people that are currently online. So compared to their respective populations, less than half of the people from the quote-unquote developing world are online. And that's compared to almost everyone from the developed world. 
And although this tide is shifting, it's still quite plausible to be a front-end developer and really only work on English websites built for people in the developed world. But like I said, in the future, things will be different and it will be much harder to maintain that kind of silo. And when you're developing for such a much more broad um, potential audience, there are three key considerations that we need to take into account. So internationalization, accessibility, and personalization. So first with internationalization. So like I said, we can no longer assume that web pages are going to be only written in left to right, top to bottom languages like English or French. And if you think about it, CSS has actually been quite unnecessarily biased towards those types of languages. For example, if we wanted to add a margin to the start of a paragraph, we would have to do something like this, where we say margin left. And if we wanted to support a right to left language like Arabic, we would have to go back and kind of override it and say, oh, but if it's this language, you have to kind of switch it around. And that's because we didn't actually mean left, we just meant the start of the paragraph. And that's where logical properties come in. And it's a change to the way that we view the box model. So instead of thinking of things like vertical and horizontal, we think of them as the block and the inline. And that changes depending on what language um, or what direction that the web page is being written in. So we would do something like this, where we just say margin inline start. And then depending on what language, it's going to either apply it to the left or the right or the top or the bottom or wherever the start of the inline actually is. So next is accessibility. And as we already heard today, um, the way I try to think about it is that when it comes to CSS and accessibility, our job is kind of to not really break the default, which is already quite accessible. So, like you said, HTML is by default accessible. And as developers, it's our job not to mess that up. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. <laughs> so, for example, not using CSS for content, which is actually the job of HTML. So not doing something like this, where instead of defining a label in the HTML, we're using CSS for it. Just because you can do it doesn't mean like we should do it. And also on doing accessible styles, which, like I said, has already even been covered today. So doing stuff like just removing all focus. Um, the defaults are there for a reason. And so whenever we are changing something, we need to actually consciously think about whether it's going to make a better or a worse experience. And just in general, styling responsibly. So be paying attention to things like contrast and colors and the text and um, accessible element sizes. And then we have um, adapting your styling to user preferences. So if everyone is online, it's going to be really difficult to make one experience that's going to be suitable for absolutely everybody and everybody's nitpicky preferences. And that's where um, the preference-based media queries come in. So we've seen things like this where we can um, change the experience based on stuff like animation preferences. So if someone has a, if someone prefers reduced motion, we can reduce or just completely remove any animation. But there are lots of other preference-based media queries. So for example, we can specify if a user would want a light or a dark theme. And what's really cool that should be coming soon is being able to adapt to data preferences. So in uh, browsers like Chrome, users can specify if they want to have like reduced data. And we're hoping soon, well, I mean, I'm from the future, so I know that this eventually happens, but <laughs> you guys don't know yet. Um, we're going to have media queries where you can hook into that and actually do stuff like um, sending less large or smaller images or other kind of performance optimizations based on that and all in CSS. So even though everyone is online, unfortunately not everyone is going to be on the latest and greatest devices. That's actually my phone, so I can show you later. <laughs> um, and because of that, performance CSS still really, really matters. 
So things like how we animate our page is really important because one of the major contributions to slow websites is basically slow or janky animations. And this is usually due to animating the wrong types of CSS or the wrong CSS properties. So something, animating something like the top property is going to be really bad and really slow. But animating something like the transform property, on the other hand, is going to be a lot more performant. Another thing to note is that CSS is still render blocking. And what this means is that when a document is loaded in the browser, it needs to go through all these steps before anything is displayed on the page. So first we build the DOM, then the CSS um, and those are put together to build the render tree. And that means that if we want our page to load as quickly as possible, we want the lightest amount of CSS as possible. And there are a few ways for us to get around this render blocking nature of CSS. So one way is by using this technique called inlining critical CSS. And what we do here is basically have a few key styles that are needed to um, style the page that the user first sees. So whatever is like the hero image or whatever, when the user first loads that page, whatever styles they need for that. So making that actually inline. And then when the page has actually fully loaded, we use a library like load CSS. And that will add a link tag to the full style sheets. And then it can be loaded and parsed and everything. But that will be happening in the background because the user will already be interacting with the page. Another technique is to split the, sp the style sheets up based on media type. So um, because unlike developers, users generally don't sit there like resizing their browser and trying to go through all the breakpoints and seeing, oh, does it look like this on mobile? Does it look like that on desktop? They generally just open up the page, and whatever media queries um, satisfy that is basically what is used. So instead of having one giant style sheet that has all the styles for all the different um, media queries, you can actually split them up into their different style sheets, and they will only be loaded if, um, if the media query is satisfied for that particular page. And what's really cool about this is that it works for basically any media query. And that means you can use them for the preference-based media queries I talked about. And these are even better to split up because unlike with base media queries, they're not really going to change. If someone already has a preference for light or dark, there's really no need for them to have styles for both. They only need to, you really should only be loading one of those styles. And finally, we have preloading style sheets. And this is where we use the special preload link to let the browser know that this resource is going to be needed. And it allows the browser to start fetching the resources we need early in the page lifecycle. And what's more, when we specify this as attribute, it allows the browser to make certain opti optimizations based on the particular um, resource type. So in this scenario, it's a style sheet, but you could also have like a script or anything else. And the browser can make optimizations in how it fetches that. And we can also do a similar thing on the server side with HTTP2 push. And um, this allows us to essentially preemptively serve a resource without even needing for the page to request it. So basically what I'm doing here is, in this example, I'm saying that whenever we see an HTML file or whenever an HTML file is being requested, you just set this link to serve up the style sheet. So obviously, um, sorry to break the bubble, obviously I'm not actually from the future. <laughs> and all of these tips are still relevant for writing CSS today. Um, basically, all of this stuff that I've gone through, like I said, it's stuff that you can um, start applying today. Even if some of these features are not available yet, the tools or the concepts of using things like progressive enhancement will allow you to um, you know, build up on the fallbacks and creates a better experience for the people who do have the latest and greatest browsers. Thank you.